Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this will be part four in uh, the study of the book of Proverbs. Uh, if you didn't see the first four episodes covering the first four chapters, uh, they're already uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, so uh, you can go back and watch them there. But today I'm going to go into uh, Proverbs chapter 5. And uh, what I'm really doing is just reading it and then trying to explain it and discuss it the best I can. So obviously, uh, I call this Wisdom Wednesdays <laughs> because from the book of Proverbs, we should be able to gain more wisdom. So each Wednesday, we'll take on another chapter. So let's begin right now with chapter 5, verse 1. It says, um, My son, attend unto my wisdom, and bow thine ear to my understanding. Over and over again, we see this um, style of writing. It's a, uh, he, he says, my son, this is of course, it's King Solomon that's writing this. And he is saying, uh, I'm talking to my son. And of course, uh, not only Solomon's son or sons uh, could benefit from these teachings, but now we have the written word of God, and so we can all benefit from this. But he, this was intended to be given to his son as, as advice from a father, how to live their life so that they can, by being wise, they will be, their life will be blessed. They'll live long, they'll be healthy, they'll be prosperous, they'll be successful. Uh, so uh, not only is this good advice for King Solomon's son, but it's good advice for all of us. So let's see what we can learn, if we can apply this to our lives. Um, he's, he's saying again, attend unto my wisdom and bow thine ear to my understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion and that thy lips may keep knowledge. So he's saying that what, one of the things that he wants his son to gain from this teaching is that uh, they will learn to be discreet and and their lips may keep knowledge lips means speak so not only will you understand wisdom uh, and will you do wise things in your life but even out of your mouth will proceed wise things you're going to say wise things instead of saying you know, bad things, unwise things, stupid things. Uh, it says, for the lips of a strange woman drop as in a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. Okay, so now we get the beginnings of the warnings from Solomon about strange women and this seductive power that they have. And, He's cautioning us for the lips of a strange woman drops drop as a honeycomb. When he says the lips, I think in this case, he's not talking about the lips in terms of uh, sexual attractiveness and, and uh, tantalizing with the kisses. He's talking about the words that come from a woman. Uh, women have a way of using the, the language speaking in a way that it can be very uh, uh, seductive, persuasive. And so we have to be very, very careful to not be like seduced by the words of, of the women. Of, it says a strange woman. For the lips of a strange woman. I think a strange woman would be someone that uh, is, is, is not your wife. Uh, uh, your, your wife is not a strange woman. Um, you, you know your wife very well and completely intimately know your wife. But a strange woman must be a woman that's not your wife 
that's unknown to you, a new woman. And even if it's not, uh, you're not in a marriage, if someone was single and they meet someone, initially it's a strange woman. So even though the strange woman could be very attractive in her appearance, her sexual seductiveness, in her, in her words, he's cautioning us about these strange women. Um, he says, for the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. So obviously there's, there's kind of a double entendre uh, in this verse here. Um, I believe here he's really talking more about the words that come from her mouth, uh, and how she's able to persuade you to do things that uh, are unwise, and you'll do it because you want to please her. Uh, perhaps you're, you're thinking that if you do what she says, that you'll get some kind of favor and return from her. So uh, it says it's, it drops as a honeycomb. The words come out of her mouth like a honeycomb. It sounds so sweet and so pleasant to listen to this strange woman. And her mouth is smoother than oil. Uh, <laughs> smoother than oil. Well, I just started including something in my uh, daily diet. It's uh, called coconut oil. I've heard learned recently it's, it, it has a lot of health benefits, but it has the texture of, of lard, but it has a pleasant taste it's, because it's coconut oil. So you put it in your mouth and it's just smooth and it just melts in your mouth. And it's, it's so smooth. I mean, I can identify with that now because I've been daily putting a little ta a tablespoon of oil in my mouth, coconut oil. And it is very smooth. And so he's describing these lips of a woman as honeycomb and smooth as oil. So he obviously wants us to understand that this strange woman is able to be very, very attractive and seductive, uh, whether it's the thing she's saying or the beauty of her lips and her mouth. Uh, so I, in that way, I think it's a double, double message and a double warning. Verse 4 says, But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Hmm. Well, that doesn't sound very good at all. But her end, in other words, when you are persuaded by this strange woman, the end result is not going to be so sweet as the honeycomb. Life will not be as smooth as, as the oil. It's, it can only be bitter. It can be a very bad experience. And it says, and it's sharp as a two-edged sword. Well, it's interesting, the uh, use of the term two-edged sword, you know, we, we think of the word of God as being sharp as a two-edged sword. Uh, it, it cuts to the, the, to the marrow. Of the, and it's, so the, um, the scriptures, had this, uh, this double-sided effect on us too. It can, it can break your heart and give you joy. It can convict you of sin, and it can make you understand your sins are forgiven. That's the word of God. But the two-edged sword of this strange woman, <laughs> it can be very pleasant. A, a strange woman can be very pleasant, very attractive with her charming words, her seductive talk, and her you know, maybe physical beauty. Very attractive and very pleasant. And yet, with if you are with this strange woman, if if you're married and you get together with a strange woman, it will, can ruin your life and ruin your wife's life. 
ruin the lives of your children and your family, ruin your reputation in the community, maybe ruin your health. So there's a, a the end is bitter as wormwood. Uh, verse five, her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. This is a, this is a pretty uh, stiff warning we're hearing here about uh, strange women. It's not strange that there's, they're bizarre or uh, you know, a very unusual type of a person. That strange just means that someone that you don't know, like your wife. You have an intimate knowledge of your wife. Any woman beyond, besides your wife that you just meet is a strange woman. Uh, her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. Well, uh, you know, I certainly am getting the message. I, I'm 64 years old now. Uh, I, I, I'm way beyond being uh, attracted by a seductress. Of course, in, in my youth, uh, I can see how this could uh, be, affect me and could even cause ruin in my life. And, uh, but sometimes we reach a point in life where through experience, and as, as we grow older, we, this strange woman does not have that kind of an attraction to us anymore. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Listen carefully. Pay attention. This is a very stern warning. And depart not from the words of my mouth. Hold on to these words. Keep hold of, of this principle, this life lesson. For your whole life, don't forget this. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house. This uh, I, I've talked bef before about the. Um, sexual attraction the problem is in life uh, as a young person you have this sex drive and and uh, scriptures tell us that we're not supposed to uh, indulge in, in that unless it's within a marriage uh, and yet the drive is powerful and so and there's a real possibility of great frustration. I mean, as a male, I can understand that side of it. I, I don't know how strong these feelings are in women. I don't even know if it's like a universal principle with women. And maybe some women have this very strong desire. And if they uh, wait till marriage and suppress those feelings and they will be frustrated. I don't know if it's all women or some women go through that, but I suspect that it's just about all men that have to experience that as we go through puberty and we start getting those feelings. And then many times for much, most of our lives, those feelings are there. And there's a great temptation for this strange woman. Uh, but, as the scripture says here, it's a two-edged sword. And it, her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. 
it's uh, it's not worth it. It's not worth it to indulge in this. If you're single, it would be called fornication, where you're having these sexual relationships with a woman. Whether it's a person you just met or, or whether a person you've known for a long time outside of a marriage, well, it can cause great problems in life. Uh, and it says here, remove thy way far from her and come not nigh the door of her house. Many years ago, I watched this uh, TV show, the, the Jerry Springer Show. I don't watch it on any regular basis, but I, I've seen it sometimes over the years. And uh, the kind of things on that show, uh, it's really not entertaining, but it is quite educational. To, uh, you learn uh, the, the horrible consequences from the, that, that kind of behavior. Um, and often I, I heard on that that, well, they couldn't help it. They, they, they were married and they decided to have some sexual relationship and affair. And maybe it's not even a strange woman, but it's maybe it's their, their father, their stepmother. Their father's married again. And, the father's son decides to have a relationship with his stepmother or the brother's wife is his, uh, your sister-in-law, whatever. They, they, these are the kinds of things you see on that show. And many times I've heard them say they couldn't help it. It just happened. Well, it doesn't just happen. It's like, uh, uh, for, sexual act to take place, it's not like, oh, you mean you just slipped on a banana peel and fell down, and, and when you fell down, you found that your penis was inside a woman. <laughs> no. That's, that would be an example of something just happening, and that's not the way fornication and adultery happens. It doesn't just happen. It's a series of decisions that leads to it. It starts with a look and a smile and a flirtations and then conversations that are tantalizing and tempting and then a plan. And then the fault following through with that plan. You've got to go through many, many doors before you reach that point where you've fornicated or committed adultery. It doesn't just happen. There are many, many opportunities to stop at one of those doors before you get to the end. So this verse here, verse eight, is saying, remove thy way far from her. That would be a very, very wise thing to do. As soon as you meet this strange woman and the flirtation begins, it says here, remove thy way far from her. Distance. I, I, I taught martial arts for many years. I don't operate in couple of martial arts schools in the past. <clears throat> There's all kinds of techniques and tactics in martial arts and self-defense. But the best defense is really just distance. If you are far away from someone, the exception to that was if they have a, a gun, you know. In that case, you want to be close if you possibly disarm them. But in normal circumstances, distance is the best defense. And this is true here. The best defense against this kind of temptation is distance. And Solomon is saying, remove thy way far from her and come not nigh 
the door of her house. You see, that's one of those doors I was talking about. The door first of smiling, being a little bit too friendly, the door of flirtation, and then the seductive conversation. Each of these is a door. Then finally, you've got the door to her house. And Solomon's saying, remove thyself far from her and come not nigh the door of her house. It's your choice. If you want to go through all those doors, one after another, then you reach her door and you go through that door. The um, short time of pleasure that you gain is not worth that double-edged sword that's going to ruin your life, cause a divorce, cause a broken family, cause sexually transmitted disease, maybe cause an unplanned pregnancy. All kinds of consequences come from these bad decisions. But thankfully, there's plenty of doors along the way where you can stop and turn around and say, I'm not going to go through that next door. It truly is not like slipping on a banana peel and you're fornicating. Uh, verse 9, Lest thou give thine honor unto others and thy years unto the cruel, lest strangers be filled with thy wealth and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. This is talking about some of the possible uh, consequences. When you go to her door, you enter her house, you succumb to this seduction, this temptation, lest thou give thine honor unto others. You lose your honor. You're disrespected in the community. In thy years unto the cruel, it could affect you for the rest of your life. The consequences of it, and maybe even the guilt and shame over it for many years. And thy labors be in the house of a stranger. And thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. <laughs> oh boy. Well, this could be talking about even the, your death and uh, maybe this death, death is caused from disease. Maybe the death is caused from a ruined life and the inability to ever succeed in anything again because of the, the shame. You, you maybe you're shamed in the community. You're exposed. And you lose your job, you lose your career, you lose your ability to earn. Maybe you res resort to drugs or alcoholism to try to escape that harsh reality of the consequences until you finally die and your flesh is consumed away. And thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed and say, how have I hated instruction and my heart despised reproof. Well, let's pray that, especially if you're a young person watching right now, let's pray that you never have to say this 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now, looking back on your life with regret, thinking, if I'd only listened. Well, the scriptures gave me instruction. <laughs> it gave me wise instructions. And it says, how have I hated instruction 
Are you going to listen to this? Are you going to learn from these wise words? He says, and my heart despised reproof. Yeah. It's very, very common for someone to hate to hear something like this. Uh, the truth is that most people naturally don't want to hear these kinds of wise sayings that we find in Proverbs because it's instructing us on the right way, the best way to live our lives and our rebellious hearts initially don't want to listen to that. We, it says, our hearts despise reproof. We hate instruction. But as we go through Proverbs, you'll find many times talking about how a wise person accepts instruction and reproof. Verse 13 is, and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. This is a person with great regret reflecting on their life. <laughs> God, I'll help us, Lord. I pray that none of you have to go through this. Look back at the end of your life and say, if I'd only listened and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, I, I don't claim personally to be your teacher. I'm just reading to you this, the scriptures. These particular scriptures are about wisdom and how best to live our lives. And if we're wise, we're going to end up with good results in our lives. If we're unwise, we end up doing stupid things and looking back with regret. And have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined my ear to them that instructed me. Please don't be like that. Please heed the words that we find in these Proverbs. I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and assembly. I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and assembly. Drink waters out of thine own cistern and running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of water in the streets. Let them be only thine own and not strangers with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Hmm. I have the wife of my youth. Uh, my wife, uh, Cindy, uh, we've been married 36 years. And I'm happy to say that I'm rejo rejoicing daily with the wife of my youth. I have to confess though, uh, wisdom didn't come to me at a young age. <laughs> now I was foolish in many ways, <laughs> but over the years, uh, the, the, the problems that, deal, that I have to deal with in life, uh, learning many times, unfortunately, the hard way. Right? We talked in an earlier study about it's wise to learn, learn from a teacher instead of wise, instead of learning from experience. Because experience is a hard teacher. It's learning the hard way. 
And I, I wish that I had these words when I was a young man to counsel me because I had to learn the hard way and to suffer some consequences because of that. But I'm happy today that uh, 30, after 36 years, I can still rejoice with the wife of, the wife of my youth. I hope you get that in your life. It's something that, for me at least, I, I didn't appreciate it near as much earlier in my life. As time's gone on, I've appreciated it much more and much more. And now, yes, I, I can actually say I'm rejoicing with the wife of my youth. Let her be as the loving, kind, and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times, and be thou ravished always with her love. This is talking about the wife now, not the strange woman. Learn to be happy with your wife. Learn to get satisfaction and happiness through your wife rather than from a strange woman. And, and why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? Well, we know that the reason it's done is because of the excitement, the, the, the sexual pleasure. And some people even are thrilled by knowing that they're doing something wrong. And in that way, it somehow even heightens the, the, the feeling. Uh, but I hope you're learning from this today. It's a grave mistake. And you don't have to do it. And it's not an impulsive thing. It's a, it's a process. It's uh, many doors have to be passed through before this happens. You have plenty of opportunities to come to your senses and be content with your wife rather than being with a strange woman and suffering for a moment of pleasure, having the possibility, the probability of all of these consequences. For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings, The Lord is watching. He knows what you're doing. See, even if you're watching now and you're not a Christian, there is no hiding place. God is watching. He, see, he sees everything you do. He sees, hears everything you say. He's even a mind reader. He knows every one of your secret thoughts. Nothing you do is really done in secret. And if you're a Christian, if you're someone who's put your faith in Christ, then you have the Holy Spirit living inside you. And the Apostle Paul tells us, how could you be with this strange woman or a prostitute, knowing that you're... You're dragging the Holy Spirit through, the, through this experience with you. The Holy Spirit lives inside you. The Spirit of God. So not only are you doing this, but you're dragging the Spirit with you. 
For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. Well, we can't, we cannot sugarcoat it and act like, well, you know, it's morality is subjective. There's no such thing as really right and wrong. It's a matter of the matter of opinion. It's moral relativity. No, if that's what you want to think, that's just some man-made philosophy. The scriptures tell us some things are declared as sin. If you go through the scriptures, you'll see a long, long list of sins. The scripture says that we all sin. All have sinned. The only person that's ever lived that did not sin is Jesus Christ. We sin many times. Some people think, well, I don't sin that much. Well, if if you understand what sin is, maybe you'll comprehend the, the real seriousness of this. You see, sin is not only uh, committing a bad act, like taking something that doesn't belong to you, or attacking and injuring someone or killing someone else. I mean, these things are black and white. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. This is committing a bad act. Uh, but scripture also says that there are sins of omission. There are many things that we, good things that we could do, good decisions we could make that we neglect to do. And when we neglect to do something good, that's a sin of omission. So there's sins of commission, bad acts we commit. Sins of omission, good things that we've neglected to do. And then there's sins of the heart, as Jesus said. You know, you, you uh, say you have never murdered, but if you, if you ever hated someone, you've already murdered them in your mind, in your heart. You say you've never committed adultery, and yet whenever you've looked at a woman, lusted for her, you've had lustful thoughts for her. You didn't do it physically, but you did it in your mind and in your heart. And Jesus said, it's just the same. It's a sin. So when we understand really what sin is, understand that we all sin a lot. Let's say that in your life, you only sinned three times a day. Only three times a day did you do something that God would say, oh, that's not the way I want you to be. And three times a day in a year is a thousand sins a year. And in 70 years, you have 70,000 sins. We're all serial sinners. And three sins a day is, is being very kind to you. You may be sinning 10 times a day or 100 times a day if we look at really what sin is, sins of commission, sins of omission, sins of the heart. So we've all sinned. We're talking today about a particular type of sin, the strange woman. His own iniquities shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. He shall die without instruction. In the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. Folly. Folly. I'm sorry. I shouldn't laugh. Just the word folly is kind of a humorous word. and It makes it almost seem humorous. But it's very, very serious. The consequences that come from sin. Of course, one consequence from sin is that we cannot have a relationship with God 
Because, see, on one hand, God is perfect and sinless, and man is full of sin. So God doesn't want to have anything to do with us because of sin. There's a sin is a barrier separating man from God. So it's impossible for man to have a relationship with God because of sin. It's impossible for man to live forever with God in heaven. God is repelled by man's sin. And if man tries to stop sinning, he can't completely stop. And man can't do anything about all the previous sins, even if he was able to stop sinning. What about all the past sins? He can never have this relationship with God. God understood the problem. God understood that man could not solve the problem. Man was in a helpless, hopeless situation. But the scripture tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's Jesus. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves us so much he gave his son, Jesus Christ. When he says he gave him, what does that mean? Jesus said that he came down from heaven and he became a man so that he could give his life as a ransom, a payment. A ransom is a payment made to set someone free. So we have this sin problem. God just loved us so much, he became a man. He died for all of our sins. When he died on that cross, he paid for all your sins and all of my sins. Now there's no barrier. Now we can embrace God. But we can only do it through Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He's the way to heaven. He's the truth that you need to believe. Believe in Jesus. He's the life everlasting. If you want to live forever in heaven, only available for Jesus. He said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. So you need to understand that because of sin, whether it's a strange woman or all the other sins, you cannot have a relationship with God. But God loves you so much. He sent Jesus and he paid the sin Remove the sin barrier. Now you can have this relationship through Jesus Christ alone. Not through Muhammad, not through Buddha, not through the Pope, not through the Virgin Mary, and not because of your own merit, not because of your own righteousness. Because the righteousness of man is like filthy rags in the sight of God. The scripture says, don't try to get this relationship with God because you say, God, I'm good enough. I can have a relationship with you. You'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. Instead, understand that Jesus paid for your sins. He died on the cross to pay for your sins. Now, if he just died on the cross and went into a tomb and still there, he couldn't give us life because he would be dead. How could he give us life if he's dead? So he raised himself from the dead on the third day. That was a sign to prove he is God and he does have the power over life and death. So now we're justified in putting our faith in him. You can feel confident that Jesus is able to give you life everlasting. You can feel confident that Jesus will give you it because he promises it to everyone who trusts him. If you put your faith in Jesus, it says he holds you in the palm of his hand. He's got a hold of you. And he says that he will never leave you or forsake you. Even if you go off and like the prodigal son, get into a pig's pen and your life gets all messed up. And guess what? You may, you may be off into sin. He's not going to let go of you. He said even if, if you lose your faith, he says, if you are have no faith, he remains faithful. He will never leave you or forsake you. No one can pluck you out of his hand. So put your faith in Jesus. Embrace Jesus. 
and be joyful knowing that you have eternal life. You're promised eternal life in the kingdom of God. And until that time comes when we go to be with Jesus in eternity, I hope you are learning from these words of King Solomon about wisdom. Yeah, we, this strange woman issue, it's just one of many different sins. And, uh, you know, as I said, we, everybody sins, everybody has sins. Some people sin more than others, but it's not the number of sins that's the issue. And some people's sin of different types of sin. It's not the variety of sin that's the problem. The problem was we've all sinned, but the good news is Jesus paid for our sins. So jump for joy and know that you can have this relationship with God through Jesus Christ, our great God and Savior. Thank you for watching. And I'll discuss chapter 6 next Wednesday. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.